All right, so this one's gonna be a little different. List content starts to lose excitement after the 95th video you make, and I see very few comprehensive breakdowns on YouTube that actually tackle the daunting task of putting sorceries and incantations into a steel cage match with each other and just seeing what happens. So consider this a beginner slash intermediate guide type video that tries its best to come across as an objective comparison until I mispronounce the word exikes 12 minutes in or something. We're gonna focus on how the two brackets of magic are handled in different portions portions of the game, the main purpose that both magic types aim to fulfill in a regular playthrough, the strengths and weaknesses of both, their subtypes, analyzing the catalyst of each type, looking at spell combo potential, all the way down to examining the stat requirements demanded by various builds. I am breaking my goddamn fingers in an attempt to take a question as broad and unfocused as the literal title of this video and condense it all down into a single guide that'll still probably get like one or two things wrong. It wouldn't be a rusty video if it were anything else. And speaking of familiarity, here's a brand you've probably grown well acquainted with over the past few years. NordVPN can keep all your data, personal information, and even search history hidden from ISPs that pretend they're interested in keeping your data private, but really aren't. You'd be surprised how rife public spaces are with criminals looking to make a quick buck or three off of your negligence. And that's even more dangerous when you can go hours or even days at a time without knowing you've been hit. In today's world, privacy being a right is debatable on the absolute best of days, and it's one of those things that a lot of ISPs and businesses tend to only consider a crime if you're you know, actually caught doing something. It also comes with its own threat protection that identifies malware and trackers on your system. You may be internet savvy enough to know a Discord Nitro scam when you see one, but scammers know to target the weakest links. So get this shit for your for your grandparents or something. They probably need it. If you sign up for an exclusive two-year deal using my link in the description, you get four free months of service on top of that. And there's a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have plenty of time to reconsider if you're having second thoughts. This is going to be a long conversation with plenty of talking points to keep us busy, so a lot of this video might feel like the audio-visual equivalent of navigating modern New York with a 60-year-old map and a vintage compass. So to make this as streamlined as possible, let's just focus on the purpose of each and go from there. Sorceries have a very clear focus on plugging enemies with enough damage before they can even get to you. Out of the 70 sorceries in the base game, 57 of them, although with a bit of status or utility sometimes sprinkled on top, still seem to rely pretty heavily on the damage they inflict. The exceptions being Karian Retaliation, Eternal Darkness, Fia's Mist, Freezing Mist, Lucidity, Scholar's Shield, Starlight, Terra Magic, Athops' Barrier, and the two Unseen spells. The following spells either have a focus entirely on inflicting status, or involve some unique utility such as crowd control or manipulating the physics of enemy spells. I was reluctant at first to include Terra Magica in here as well because it's fundamentally the same as Scholar's Armament, or another buff that essentially just equates to dealing more damage as an end result, but Terra Magica Magicka only applying its damage boost to a limited physical space I think is enough to consider it some kind of utility. And although some utility sorceries like Thops' Barrier and Scholar's Shield have very specific applications that can allow them to perform incredibly in certain situations, most others end up getting ignored or are just flat out unnecessary in the worst of cases, leading to a common stereotype that the whole of sorcery can be pared down to just shooting blue shit from a stick. Incantations, on the other hand, have functions that are much more isolated and widely spread. This is the class that allows you to heal, mitigate elemental damage and sometimes multiple types of damage at once, inflict status like poison, rot, and madness, various damage buffs that can stack with one another if chained correctly, all the way down to obscuring enemy vision and losing aggro, either to allow an escape or open a window for a critical hit. There are 101 incantations compared to the 70 sorceries, and of those incantations, 66 of them can be considered spells with a clear focus on damage, while the remaining 35 are spells like Golden Vow that boost both damage and defense, Swarm of Flies and Poison Mist that deal almost no damage but inflict very high status buildup, various healing and damage negation spells, and finally dedicated utility spells like Rejection, Shadow Bait, Darkness, and Assassin's Approach that are generally used with one specific purpose in mind. Incantation builds are normally thought of as the more nuanced half of Elden Ring's magic tree, and whereas that's definitely true, nothing I've said so far in this script has even covered the full reason why. Incantations are very widely spread in terms of function, that much is certainly the case, but there's also the outlier group, which comprises incantations that are so unconventionally apart from everything else in the game that they just kind of form their own subset of magic because of how weird they are. Like some real playing by yourself and making explosion noises at recess kind of vibes. 
Law of Regression is an extremely powerful incantation that not only cleanses all status effects and debuffs on your character, but also nullifies enemy buffs such as the War Cry from Grave Duelists or aromatic buffs from Perfumers. And the fact that it only has an intelligence requirement despite being an incantation means common mid-game sorcery builds can very easily use it provided they have enough faith to use a Sacred Seal. Inescapable Frenzy is a grab attack that can only be performed on other player characters, limiting its use entirely to NPC invaders if you're offline, and although Frenzy Flame incantations as a whole rely on madness buildup, they still inflict innate fire damage, making them equally capable in PvE situations. Grail's Roar can be argued as both a damage and a utility spell in one since the Shockwave deals enough physical damage to be considered a damage-oriented spell, in addition to weakening enemy attack and defense. And I'm not too sure if this counts, but I'm going to anyway. I would even argue the DOT effect you find on Black Flame spells scaling off the enemy's maximum health is somewhat of a utility as well, because even if something is resistant to fire, the gradual damage will still be the same amount. This makes it much more difficult to efficiently divide incantations into clear subtypes, because it's not all too uncommon to be completely blind to a spell's hidden benefits when you have multiple incantations capable of fulfilling multiple roles. Incantation magic is pretty much indisputably the more diverse and all-encompassing half of Elden Ring's magic system, but incantations in a way can feel just as incredibly repetitive as its sorcery counterpart. As cool as I personally find the Dragon Communion incantations to be, it's hard to ignore that the majority of its library consists of pointing yourself in a single direction and breathing various substances down your enemy's throats. The setbacks that some spells are meant to counteract are almost never a consistent enough problem to warrant dedicating a spell slot to it, and if I'm being perfectly honest, we just do not need this many fucking healing spells. We just don't. Being able to grab Fortis Axe's Lightning Spear around mid-game from a boss fight that's regrettably as easy as dragon bosses come, combined with the fact that regular Ancient Lightning Spear won't be accessed until the game's penultimate domain practically guarantees you either won't find it or won't use it. Sorceries aren't exactly immune to this treatment either, but we'll circle back to this in a few minutes. Sorceries have a total of 14 separate subtypes, or schools, of magic, some of which are severely lacking in quantity, such as the Clayman, Aberrant, and Stone Digger sorceries, while others, like the Karian subtype, almost seem to have way too many. It's hard to tell where the divide should be properly drawn, because a couple subtypes can be argued as part of a more plentiful, more overarching class of magic, such as Loretta sorceries technically falling into the Karian division. This is important because sorceries like Adula's Moonblade share properties from both Karian and and cold sorceries. It deals frostbite status, it gets boosted by the Karian Glintstone Staff, since it falls under the definition of a sword sorcery, and it flings forward an ice wave, which one, gives it significantly more range than other sword sorceries, and two, enables the full sorcery to potentially hit twice if an enemy is within close enough range. It's this combination of benefits that makes Adula's Moonblade an incredibly powerful spell choice with very few substitutes. Cold magic is typically favored because it's one of the only sorcery divisions that inflicts status, and it also helps that the cold subtype consists of five quality spells that are all very useful in tons of situations, albeit in different ways. Another of the strongest sorcery types would probably be gravity magic, which is also a school of five sorceries. Rock Sling, for instance, has long been a staple in most common sorcery builds. Dealing physical damage means its performance is never less than serviceable, the friendly stat requirements and FP consumption allow it to be picked up without too much hassle or preparation, and the above average poise damage damage ensures that it has plenty of utility even in the late game. Gravity Well and Collapsing Stars allow enemies to be physically displaced and brought towards you, which gives it great synergy with melee sorceries, but with the right setup, they're capable of outpacing most other beginner sorceries and damage. And Meteorite of Estelle is... Well, it, it's, it's Meteorite of Estelle. Night Sorceries may not be the greatest option overall because some of what it calls utility spells have all the utility of an underwater power outlet, but it is home to what's arguably the single most ruptured sorcery in the game, which is, of course, the esteemed Night Comet. And Aberrant Sorceries are pretty notorious for the lack of love they were given in the game's early days, but admittedly, these spells aren't too bad. After a sequence of changes brought on by multiple patches, it's now come to a point where the two 
sorceries are fairly reliable. Briars of Punishment has a much better tracking than it used to, Briars of Sin has some hyper armor that helps it out quite a bit, and their capability of dealing great damage now means they're in a spot where they feel more independently reliable, and the use of one aberrant sorcery no longer facilitates the other. If we were to consider the strongest incantation subtype, there's a couple easy choices that immediately come to mind. Obviously, there are the flame incantations, which consist of home runs like Burn O Flame and Flame Grant Me Strength. There's the Dragon Cult subtype, which is the proud owner of damage cannons like Ancient Lightning Strike and Death Lightning. And Dragon Communion builds give Faith Arcane builds easy access to magic damage and frostbite status. Although I still think overall, the Frenzy Flame subtype has by far the most application of any other. Frenzy Flame magic inflicts madness, which is a special status ailment that can only be applied to other players or NPC invaders, but its innate fire damage also gives it an extra few applications if you're sticking to PvE, making it the only incantation subtype that's in this powerful a position in both environments. The Rot Servant's incantations aren't nearly as powerful as the aforementioned, but I feel as though they're certainly the most overlooked. Poison Mist has its own niche applications all the way into the mid-game, although it inflicts a status that makes very minimal difference around later areas of the game. Pest Threads puts in incredible amounts of damage into larger enemies, and Scarlet Aeonia no longer feels like wasting three spell slots on what's basically a glorified gesture. When considering the weakest classes of each, some easy decisions can also be made for the sorcery library, mainly the subtypes of magic that only have two available spells for you to use, and in that regard the Clayman sorceries come to mind almost immediately. The Great Oracular Bubble has a very slow velocity that allows you to stack it up with other spells on unaware enemies, but outside of that niche benefit, the utility of the Clayman sorceries aren't nearly going to be as ever-present as spells in the Karian or Gravity subtypes. The Death sorceries could also use, a, like, a lot of work if I'm being honest. The two main damage sorceries of this subtype are both multi-projectile, making it very hard to pierce through flat defenses of enemies in the beginning of the game, which wouldn't be such a problem if Rancor Call wasn't found in Stormvale Castle, the game's very first legacy dungeon. While the actual performance of the spell won't even slightly stand out amongst others until you're well into the game. Additionally, I don't think I need to even weigh in on the problems in circling Fia's Mist at the moment. N n nothing short of a full overhaul is going to save this waste of pixels. I, I don't know how I would even begin, just, just fix it. It needs fixed. The Two Fingers incantations are intended to be an accessible beginner's library of magic that even sorcery builders shouldn't have a problem meeting the requirements of, and on that merit alone, some credit is certainly due. But most of its utility spells offer very little that you can't get somewhere else, and when people begin criticizing incantations for having a bloated selection where some spells exist entirely just to make the library look bigger, this is the subtype they're usually thinking about, especially when some improved variants of the listed spells like Flame Cleanse Me can be found decently early into the game, whereas bestial incantations almost seem to suffer from the exact opposite problem. Sure, it might be worth collecting two death root just so you can have access to bestial sling, but it has nowhere near the stopping power it used to. Both beast claw incantations have been mediocre for as long as I can remember, and the only one that stands out as a consistent all-rounder seems to be Stone of Garank, which is awarded to you after finding six death root. But that's really what most have come to expect with incantations. Even if a particular subtype offers very little in terms of performance or utility, there's usually one or two that can still pull some weight. Now that I've formally introduced both branches of the magic system, we can move on to the strengths and weaknesses of each as a whole. I'm anticipating this to be the longest section by far because of how stringent you can really get with the details. Starting with sorcery, the first benefit you'll notice pretty much immediately upon starting a new game is that the two sorcery starting classes are set up noticeably better than the two faith classes. A standard healing incantation is far from the strongest choice, just because 32 FP is a pretty enormous order for someone who's literally at the start of the game. Glintstone Pebble and Magic Glint Blade, on the other hand, not only do sustainable damage in the beginning, but end up becoming two of the strongest workhorses well into the mid-game and debatably even further on. Glintstone Pebble benefits from being increasingly FP efficient the further into the game while still being able to deal damage that isn't much compared to its upgraded variants, but still not exactly insignificant. And Magic Glint Blade has the invaluable utility of being able to be delayed further by charging it, allowing it to be stacked with other spells in the process 
process. Catch Flame does get pretty substantially powerful the more you go forward, and the Prophet does start out with 16 faith, making this an ideal start for dedicated builds of that type. But the point is mostly that being your only choice, whereas both the Sorcerer Alliance starting classes have pretty fleshed out kits from the get-go. Another notable strength of sorcery builds is that they tend to lend themselves much more to melee combat. Out of the total 70 sorceries, there are 26 sorceries that either are better suited for closer ranges, pull enemies towards you, or are just outright melee-centered spells, comparing this to the 23 incantations that I counted. These are rough estimates, of course, since someone's individual playstyle could always make a case for one or two spells I'm not thinking of, but with gravity spells that pull enemies towards you, the two digger spells, and pretty much the entire carrion library, I think sorceries tend to stand out as the stronger performers when it comes to close quarters. Not to mention, some of the same sorceries climb absurdly high in damage the more you invest into them. I know I don't have to make a case for Kari and Slicer, but the damage on Shatter Earth is definitely nothing to scoff at either. You've also got access to some of the most reputable heavy hitters in the market like Night Comet, Meteorite of Estelle, and Shard Spiral. You can pick up some powerful Frostbite spells once you start digging into the mid-game, and the two prior spells also means you aren't completely helpless when it comes to inflicting bleed. Though I think the benefit most people constantly underappreciate is just how strong the Astrologer's class's starting staff actually is. I'm not gonna bore anyone with math since school started back for most of you like a month ago, and there's already plenty of great videos out there that measure catalysts against each other in a mathematical way. But the Astrologer staff has an astounding 230 in scaling once you hit 40 intelligence, which shockingly ends up being much stronger than most other mid-game catalysts, rivaled only by the Demi-Human Queen staff and the Academy Glintstone staff, both of which are within very comfortable reach at the beginning of the game. And if that isn't enough, then you've also got the Meteorite staff that isn't located too far into Kaled, which might be the single strongest starter staff in the entire game. The obvious benefit to incantations is simply that there's more of them. This ultimately means a more versatile build, more spells within reach of your character at the start of the game, and the freedom to really hammer out a spell loadout that's more appropriate for any specific encounter. Despite only having an expanse of 12 different subtypes, not including Placidus Axe's Ruin for some stupid reason, each class feels quite a bit more equipped than other sorcery subtypes. You won't find any family of incantations struggling to come up with two unique spells. Even the smallest incantation classes usually clock in at 4, which still isn't great, but it's a massive step up from 2, just because it allows space for support magic alongside one or two reliable damage options. Incantations also allow players an extra line of protection against many instances where your sudden in-game squishiness might be a bit too much to deal with. Having Flame Protect Me stashed away in some dungeon hidden in the mountaintops seems arbitrary and meaningless until you remember that there are three fire-aligned brick shithouses waiting to give you a nice shakedown towards the end game. These kinds of support incantations aren't uncommon, but their value only continues to increase as bosses get more nuanced along the late game and no longer tie themselves to a single type of damage, a huge benefit that sorceries almost entirely seem to miss out on. If we're speaking strictly about the fun factor between the two, I think most can readily admit that incantations are certainly stronger in a creative sense. There's never been a single Souls game where I can just pull out an ethereal dragon head and start using it as a weapon, and there probably won't be another game that gives you abilities like that in a long time, just because of how outrageously over the top it is. But that very frequently seems to be the point of incantations. Part of why people find them so fun, as opposed to sorceries, is because the absence of a staff allows you as a player to feel more involved in the combat. You're not swinging a wooden stick that makes the spell happen, you're making it happen yourself. It's one less layer of separation between you and the spell. And I know other people agree with this because one of the most popular mods on Nexus right now allows you to cast sorceries from your own hand. Now, it's very easy to say that inflicting status is a strength that's shared among sorceries and incantations both, particularly given that Frostbite and Blood Loss are two extremely powerful status ailments both inside and outside of offline play. However, I still don't consider this a strength of sorceries because saying this by itself doesn't necessarily take into account that leveling Arcane increases the amount of status buildup you inflict except 
when it comes to frostbite for some reason. This leaves you with only two reliable sorceries that having arcane as a secondary focus will actually benefit, which are the two thorn sorceries. And they just so happen to be boosted by a staff that scales exclusively with faith and not arcane. What 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 in the fucking shit? Who made this? Who made this staff? This is a very weird way to bottleneck the performance of status on sorcery builds, and I've never understood why these decisions were made. Incantations give you access to various poison builds with the Servants of Rot incantations, Madness with the Frenzy Flame subtype, and Blood Magic, all of which pull some very enticing advantages from the arcane stat. This also facilitates the existence of the Dragon Communion Seal, which not only scales with Faith and Arcane very comfortably, but also ends up being objectively the most powerful incantation catalyst on a new game run. But most of these benefits, I think, misrepresent incantation builds as too complicated, which can drive people away from getting too invested in what you can do. A secondary focus in Arcane is obviously far from necessary. It's not often the linchpin of a good incantation build, it, it just kind of helps every now and then. In reality, you're probably going to have a much easier time leveling yourself for incantations than you would sorceries, simply because of the stat requirements for sacred seals are much friendlier on average. The highest any seal is ever going to ask of you is 40 faith, whereas sorcery builds are being whacked over the head by staves that demand your intelligence be stacked into the 50s before you've even cleared Rhea Lucaria. Even when considering individual spells, sorcery still loses on this front, because the highest stat requirement for any incantation so far is 50 faith. You have in-game spells like Placidus Axe's Ruin and Scarlet Aeonia that both fall into the mid-30s, while Black Blade and Death Lightning have a slightly higher requirement of 46 and 47, which is a solid 20 points below what's normally required for in-game sorceries. Casting a full moon sorcery with a worthwhile in-game staff like Regal Scepter not only requires around 70, 80 intelligence to actually be good, but also demands a massive FP investment on top of it. There's a total of 6 sorceries that climb above 50 intelligence as a minimum, and 5 of 18 staves that all require a minimum of 48, being the 2 Crystal Staves, Regal Scepter, and the 2 Grandmaster Staves. This provides a wonderful segue into what I personally believe to be one of the most glaring deficiencies in sorcery builds as a whole. They just ask too fucking much from you. Incantations will admittedly throw you a curveball every now and then, placing Frozen Lightning Spear and Flame of the Fell God in the second Legacy Dungeon and then asking you 30 to 40 faith, so it's not like either branch of magic isn't guilty of this sort of thing. But sorcery just takes it way too far at way too many points. Giving someone a staff with an asking price of 60 intelligence as a reward for being beating the second legacy boss in the game is only guaranteeing that it's going to be ignored for three months until someone on the internet eventually gets curious and decides to build around it, only to then figure out how good it actually is and tell everyone. And of course it is. It better be for 60 fucking intelligence, Jesus Christ. It does make sense in terms of world building that most of the better staves are located in Liurnia, but from a gameplay standpoint it only feels like being roadblocked, further enforcing newer players who may not know of the payoffs to stick with a mid-game alternative like the Academy staff. This only makes the somewhat unengaging playstyle of sorcery stand out even further. Extending on what I said about incantations, a lot of players tend to have more fun with a faith-based magic build, simply because there's something about the lack of needing to channel power through a wooden rod that makes you feel more connected to what you're doing. It's not too rare an occurrence to see multiple sorceries tied to the same one or two animations. The glint blade spells all use the same animation, the basic pebble family of sorceries all use the same one, which isn't necessarily a complaint. Dragon Communion incantations have the exact same animation, just with a different colored dragon depending on what you're casting. It's a detail that makes sense, but if you were to take away the casting sigil that determines the family of sorcery you're using, a lot of staff animations start looking very, very similar to each other. Of course, you still have the full moon sorceries and the Kari and sword sorceries that literally turn your staff into an ethereal weapon, but standard spells like Discus of Light and Flame Sling, for instance, look fundamentally different from each other in a way that can't be visually represented presented as clearly when all your magic is being channeled through some type of instrument. So that's it, right? Incantations are hands down the better choice, they have more variety, more flexibility across different builds, you don't have to worry about the steep requirements in the mid to late game, and they make for a much more interesting playthrough on average due to having more dynamic animation. This is a lame transit, this sucks. This su Of course that's not what I'm saying. Look at how much time there is left in this video. Why do YouTubers like doing this transition so much? Who, who the fuck cares? Moving on. It's no debating that incantations easily have the upper hand in flexibility and sheer quantity of spells you can pin on your character. 
nature, but an excess in variety usually yields a lack of purpose, which brings us to what I think is the most obvious weakness of incantation magic. If you were to actually look down the list of support magic, for instance, it would only take a few seconds before realizing that a lot of them are fundamentally the exact same spell only with a slightly higher efficiency and FP cost than the one listed before it, leading to the idea that there's almost always a better version available if you just take the time to look around. When it comes to status effects, for example, incantations can very commonly overlap in what status they cure, making some significantly weaker than what they would be otherwise, and in worst cases, just flat out obsolete. Alleviating poison, sleep, and blood loss in one fell swoop is almost never going to be used to its maximum efficiency, because there isn't a single environment in the whole game outside of PvP where you're in danger of being afflicted with all three at the same time. Cure Poison offers very little because there's an incantation accessible immediately from the beginning of the game that cures both Poison and Rot while only demanding 12 faith, and most healing incantations primarily just come down to how much FP you're willing to trade, since they're functionally the exact same otherwise. There is also a notable shortage of Sacred Seals, especially when compared to the amount of staves in the game. Some would make the argument that it's a simpler approach to a magic system that otherwise feels too convoluted, but 9 Sacred Seals compared to the 18 staves you're given feels very, very uneven. Most catalysts will end up boosting a specific subtype of magic if you're a sorcerer, and we're talking damage improvements of around 20-30% to 30 on average, so very far from insignificant. The only subtypes of sorceries that aren't boosted by a staff are the Clay Man, Cold, and Primeval sorceries. Regular Glintstone magic and some Karian sorceries like Loretta's Great Bow aren't boosted by any catalyst, but there are some offshoot subtypes found in larger magic families such as the Digger and Glint Blade sorceries that do get boosted. Incantations, on the other hand, suffer a great deal more. Erdtree, Rot Servants, and Blood Incantations all go without significant boosts from a Sacred Seal. And this may not sound like a huge difference, but keep in mind the largest sorcery subtype that's left without a boost contains only 5 spells. The Erdtree family by itself contains 13, and it's home to some of the hardest hitting incantations in the game like Black Blade and Wrath of Gold, indicative of an incredible opportunity to include a seal that boosts Erdtree incantations, only to come up short. The two Grandmaster staves don't boost primeval sorceries, but they do come with their own interesting benefits such as extremely high scaling for 50% more FP, or quicker base casting for 20% more. Do you have any idea how massive a perk like that would be for certain incantations? As powerful as the Dragon Communion spells are, spooling one up feels like trying to start a half-dead Subaru. For seconds at a time, you're just holding a button down hoping nothing comes up behind you and kicks the shit out of you. On that note, the damage on some incantations can easily rival that of the game's top tier sorceries, which is important to note considering sorceries are a bit more known for their ability to just dump thousands of points of damage into a given area in a couple of seconds. And given what I've learned about the game and its inner workings since it's released, having Catch Flame on a starting class is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard in my life. It is such an insanely good starter incantation that ends up performing over most others even at an end game level, but you better get used to it because it's extremely inconvenient coming across any other reliable damage incantations, unless you really go off the beaten path, giving incantations a bit of a reputation for being hard to set up, at least not until you've passed the first two legacy dungeons. I already talked about how sorcery starter classes tend to set the player up in a way that's much more equipped for damage, but you also have a merchant not even 5 minutes away from the first grace that sells you Crystal Barrage and Scholar's Armament, two of the most underrated damage sorceries I can think of, and the item needed to unlock Glint Blade Phalanx and Karian Slicer is literally like a few pixels across the map. Even the Conspectus Scroll isn't exactly hard to get to if you're considering Rhea Lucaria as part of the main journey, so you can potentially have Comet Shard, Karian Slicer, and and a failing spell just by collecting some fucking parchment. Any prayer books you find at the beginning of the game only come up disappointing, as you slowly realize nothing will ever be able to outpace the damage of Catch Flame. The Dragon Cult prayer book can be found near Lyurnia's Artist Shack, and it can be looted from a random Dragon Cult knight just pacing back and forth in a grass field for no reason, so I kinda just ignored him for like the first three playthroughs without ever considering he might actually drop something worth having.
Okay, so moving on to the next section. I'm not expecting this part of the video to be that stringent compared to the word vomit I just subjected you to for the past 12 minutes, but to builds that are primarily interested in casting, this might be an interesting topic. Spell chaining. Firstly, magic glint blade and other glint blade spells are practically built to combo with other sorceries. Charging magic glint blade can add a good second and a half to its delay, and you can then predict when it's going to fire and take advantage of it by synchronizing it with another high damage spell in your loadout. You can do this to a lesser effect with with slower moving spells like Great Oracular Bubble, Rikard's Rancor, and the two Death Rancor sorceries. Obviously, there's the combo potential with the two Briar spells, as I think most people are aware of by now. But you can also string together sorceries in a more unconventional way. The delay on Roiling Magma, for instance, gives you just enough time to pull stray enemies into its blast radius using the gravity spells. The Full Moon sorceries also have a bit of combo potential with its slower than average speed, but exceedingly high tracking. If you're starting to detect a theme here, then yes you are very observant. Being mindful of projectile speed and stacking spells in a way that they all hit their mark at relatively the same time is the gist of combining sorceries. Spell chaining isn't as straightforward with incantations, but once you notice certain things about how certain spells operate, you can actually find more comfortable chains than you normally would on sorceries. Discus of Light is a fairly straightforward example since it's able to hit its targets twice after a delay, and you can then anticipate the return of the disc by stacking another incantation on top of its impact. You you also have spells with notably quick recovery times that are meant to be cast repeatedly, such as Catch Flame, Bestial Sling, and Blood Flame Talons. Even Noble Presence and Lightning Spear aren't terrible options as far as recovery goes, but they're more often saved at the end of whatever your spell chain is. The reason these tend to work better than most others is because they're able to be cast in succession, and therefore you can very quickly swap back and forth between them mid-combat. Although this is usually how you'll be chaining incantations together for the most part, there are also some slower moving spells like Flame of the Fell God, Whirl of Flame, and I guess Elden Stars if you're into that shit. But if you're searching for something a bit more advanced, you can take advantage of blood incantations like Swarm of Flies or Blood Boon. Bleed procs can force a stagger on most regular sized enemies, so if you know a certain chain of spells that can proc bleed on pretty much anything, you can follow it up with another high damage incantation while enemies are recuperating. We've covered just about everything in terms of what to expect from either type of magic, but combing through every single benefit of each is an unreasonably tall order for someone who's currently in the middle of brainstorming ideas for his next magic overhaul. However, what I can do is dedicate the final part of this video to the more underappreciated positives of each, such as the fact that magma spells give sorcery builds easy access to fire damage, or how certain dragon communion spells give faith users a means of dealing magic damage. This sort of multifaceted approach to magic has been a very welcome change of pace, and the days where sorcery and faith builds were each locked into certain elements of damage is mostly a thing of the past. Sorceries have been trying their best out there to break free of the stigma that they might as well be playing a point-and-click adventure game. Whether or not it's actually making significant strides in doing so is still still up for debate, but at least they're trying. As a result, we have utilities like Eternal Darkness, Karian Retaliation, and Thops's Barrier. Eternal Darkness is honestly very hit and miss on the best of days, but Thops's Barrier somehow wound up in an incredible incredibly strong position simply because it's a consistent hard counter against bosses who like to projectile spam like Elden Beast. And there's a surprising amount of larger projectiles you can block with Karian Retaliation, such as the Glintstone Missiles from Magic Dragons and Deathblade Projectiles from Black Knife Assassins. Something that almost never gets brought up in the whole elemental damage debate is how certain elements carry their weight into multiplayer, and although it's still true that fire damage remains the most applicable, lightning resistance being lower by default on player characters is a detail that's commonly looked over, making dragon cult incantations incredibly useful in their own niche, even if the seal they're boosted by could be described as dumpster adjacent. Additionally, people commonly seek out beginner godslayer incantations like Black Flame and Black Flame Blade, only needing 20 and 7 faith respectively, to challenge themselves on low-level runs while still being able to take advantage of a DOT effect that scales off of maximum HP. And of course, you have access to holy damage, which yes, is, is kind of wet, greasy garbage in the middle of July, but it has its benefits for clearing out certain dungeons because of the damage it does to skeletons and deathbirds. And revenants. Try healing when you're next to a revenant. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, you thought the fire resetting frostbite tip was getting old? You're lucky I'm not saying this shit for the next 15 videos. I don't think you need a 30 plus minute video to tell you that there's no real answer to this question. At least not one that's worth searching for. Sure, you can measure the two against each other, factoring in every possible facet of the experience you could possibly think of, from build variety to accessibility all the way down to how cool the animations look, but if there was an objectively measured answer that decisively favored one over the other, it would just be a boring question to ask. Both can optimally perform under the right conditions, and whereas I personally tend to lean towards incantation magic, that's obviously just a personal preference. And declaring that either is better in any matter-of-fact way is honestly only going to feed a cycle of provocation. Sorceries tend to excel in single-target damage, crowd controlling, and area denial in ways that incantations struggle to keep up with, but lack any meaningful versatility that allows sorcery builds to be self-sustaining. Incantations arguably have a bit too much versatility to the point where some spells feel very functionally repetitive, but commanding such a width of elemental damage and status effects makes you more likely to be prepared for a larger array of circumstances. Incantations are when you feel like picking apart enemy defenses with class and grandeur, and sorceries are for when something just really needs to fucking die. Neither solution is really incorrect, even if one of them might be somewhat indicative of sociopathy.